News Channel 8, keeping you informed on events in your community. Ann Brinkman. Present. Ellen Bucknam. Present. Amanda Weaver. Present. Tracy Gildner. Present. Dick Matthews. Here. Scott Ohm. Here. Monica Duran. Here. Steve Timms. Here. Could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I move for approval of the uh, agenda. Second. Any vote, please? And the motion passes unanimously. I move for approval of the minutes of the February 16, 2012 meeting. Second. Call for the vote, please. Oops. Can that motion pass us with commissioners? Do you want to vote again? Let's, I'll sure. clear the board and we can vote again. Let's re-vote, please. Okay. Whoops. <laughs> Maybe I... Yeah, you're fine. We get it? Did you get the names out of the way? Okay. <laughs> okay. The motion passes with Commissioners Weaver, Gildner, and Duran uh, abstaining. Uh, next item on the agenda is the public forum. This is the time for any person to speak on any subject not appearing on the agenda. We don't believe we have anybody here tonight, so we'll move on to the next item. The public hearing, case number WZ12-01, an application filed by the City of Wheat Ridge for approval of a zone change from Agricultural 1 to Public Facilities for property located at 11210 West 45th Avenue. If we could have the presentation by the city, Lauren. All righty. Good evening. My name is Lauren Michalak. I'm a planner with the Community Development Department of the City of Wheat Ridge tonight. I am presenting case number WZ1201 which is a request for approval of a zone change from Agricultural 1 to the Public Facility Zone District on property located at 11210 West 45th Avenue. I'd like to enter into the public record the contents of the case file, the zoning ordinance, uh, the comprehensive plan, and this digital presentation. The property is within the City of Wheat Ridge. All appropriate notification and posting requirements have been met. Therefore, Planning Commission does have jurisdiction to hear this case. All right, um, here's a quick aerial. This is from 2010. The subject property is outlined in green. Um, it's north of 44th Avenue, just to orient you between Quail and Parfait Streets. The site is about one and a half acres in size, and it was purchased by the city in 2009 for the purpose of expanding the existing Wheat Ridge maintenance facility. The existing maintenance facility is what you see outlined in purple, um, it's just immediately to the south of the subject site. The total of these two pieces of property together is about five acres. Um, you can see that that northern subject parcel doesn't have any direct street access, um, with the exception of 50 feet of frontage along West 46th Avenue, where that road dead ends into the um, western edge of the property. Um, primary access to the site would be through West 45th. Fifth Avenue, so over here from the east through the existing maintenance facility, and a, a gate would be located on the west side for emergency access at 46th. We've got a zoning map. Um, we're here tonight because the zone change is being requested just on this northern parcel, again outlined in green. It's currently zoned Agricultural 1, indicated by that green color. The surrounding properties as you can see, include a wide range of zoning designations. Um, we'll start to the south. That blue is the plan facilities zone district on the existing maintenance facility, the developed portion. Uh, to the west and southwest is a residential neighborhood zoned residential two, which accommodates single and two family dwellings. Uh, to the north and east 
is again agricultural one, and those are primarily multi-acre properties that do have residences, residential uses. Um, and then again to the um, southeast is a residential two neighborhood. You can see that along a little bit further to the south along 44th are some more commercial zone districts, this pink C1. Uh, another land use I should mention on the corner here at Parfait and 45th is the Alpine Valley School. So mostly residential, ag, and then the school. <clears throat> so a little bit of background on this property. Uh, the area has long been used as a site of a maintenance facility. From my searching through the archives, the most historic information I could find was that it was used for Jefferson County before the city incorporated. So I don't have a date of when it first existed or was developed, but at least back to the 60s. Um, when the city incorporated in 1969, we inherited it as the public works operations facility. It's expanded since then. It's gone through a few iterations of zone changes as the zoning code has changed over the last 40 years. Um, most recently, in 2004, we passed, or we, the public works and parks departments um, worked on a master plan for the property recognizing that it's a pretty big site and it serves a lot of uses and they needed to think of it a little bit more comprehensively. So City Council approved that in 2004. Um, and in keeping with that master plan, that lower portion of the property, oh, I should move on. So this is just a concept plan from that master plan. And it shows sort of how these two properties are hopefully eventually going to relate to each other and be treated as one, one parcel. Um, this isn't by any means sort of a final site plan with exact building footprints, but for illustrative purposes. Um, as I said, in 2006, the southern portion that's already developed was rezoned from agricultural and residential zone districts to public facilities. Um, and also in 2006, this farthest west building, the police evidence building and storage area was developed. In 2009, as I mentioned, we, the city purchased this subject site outlined in green and that brings us to today, um, where we're requesting, the city is requesting the zone change on that northern piece from agricultural one to public facilities. Um, and some of the buildings that are on the existing parcel would include the police evidence building, there's a um, fueling station where all city vehicles are fueled, there's a office building for the public works operations guys, um, vehicle storage, vehicle maintenance, the salt barn, several outbuildings. <clears throat> Excuse me. So a couple of photos. This is a more current aerial borrowed from Google Maps. You can see on the subject site that the ditch that used to traverse the property has been relocated to the perimeter. So you still see the scar a little bit down the center. This area to the north has not been paved or surfaced at all because eventually it'll probably serve as a detention facility. Um, you can see some of the residential neighborhoods to the northwest. Um, the property is a quasi-public facility, so I know it, it may be possible that some of you didn't make it inside. These are a couple photos from inside the developed portion of the maintenance facility. So we're looking at one of the offices and the vehicle maintenance shop over to the left. This is looking um, northwest. In the foreground, you're seeing the fuel canopy. In the background over here is the salt and sand barn. Um, and to the right here is the fence that separates the developed portion from the subject site. So again, um, looking towards the subject parcel that's currently fenced off <clears throat> on all sides. And this is a view of the subject site and what the structures that you're seeing on the other side of the fence are those adjacent residences. Another wide angle view. Um, again, the, the property is one and a half acres. It's a, almost a perfect square, about 255 feet long on each edge. So that's not quite the length of the football field. Quick um, review of the development standards of the existing and proposed zone districts. So the request is to rezone the undeveloped portion from A1 to public facilities. And from a use perspective, it will make it uh, more restrictive. So in the public facilities zone districts, it's established really just for um, 
public and or governmental and quasi-governmental buildings, facilities, and storage. There's no special uses in the public facilities district. This table is comparing those development standards. So notably, uh, you can have more more buildings essentially on the public facilities district. That first line lot coverage, 25% max in A A1, 80% max in public facilities. Um, the setbacks are pretty similar. In this case, um, Parks and Public Works have expressed that if they developed, they'd be probably doing 15-foot um, setbacks on the side and the rear here. So you could add those together and assume that's what it would be. Landscaping is the same. Um, two of the, the bigger differences that makes a difference for the departments that would be using the property um, are barbed wire fencing and outdoor storage. So currently in A1, you can have a barbed wire fence if it's three feet inside the property line with a second fence on the property line. Um, and in the public facilities district, you can have a barbed wire fence on the top of a six foot fence, no taller than two feet. And then additionally, outside storage accessory to a governmental building is a permitted use, whereas under the current standard, it's a special use. And that's something that we envision that the Parks Department, will, who will be using the site primarily for storage, would maybe need to take advantage of. Um, in my mind, and some of the folks that had come to the neighborhood meeting, barbed wire fences can uh, imply sort of chain link and razor wire. So I just wanted to highlight real quickly what's out there today. Um, the police, parks, and public works departments have expressed a desire for the barbed wire for security pur purposes based on what they're going to eventually hope to store out there. Um, so you can see that it's just straight line barbed wire across the top of those vertical posts. And then those posts are already in place. This fence is in place. There's no wire there now. Um, the public facilities district does have landscaping requirements, so there would be some buffering. And in particular, when barbed wire fencing is allowed in this zone district, <clears throat> excuse me, the zoning code specifically states that um, when it's next to existing residential development, you want to consider minimizing the impact through buffering, and that's something that we would look at down the road once we got site plans and additional um, development details. As I mentioned, we did have a neighborhood meeting February 1st. Seven people were in attendance from the neighborhood, a pretty good turnout. We had a long discussion about um, the process. One of the things that we told them that you guys should know is that this is just the first step of several applications that will have to be submitted for this property. So zone change first, and then um, the, the current site that we're looking at is its own parcel. The existing maintenance facility is made up of two parcels. So we've requested that they consolidate. So the next application that you would see is a consolidation plat to put those three into one parcels. And then additionally, as you saw in the aerials, there are several primary buildings out there with the intention of adding more buildings. And so we've requested that they complete a planned building group um, with more than five structures. You guys would be the, the planning commission would be the deciding authority on that um, group, that application. So you'll see a consolidation plot and a planned building group. Um, we let the neighbors know at the neighborhood meeting that there would be consecutive public hearings as those applications were submitted. <clears throat> as a part of the referral, um, we sent the application to several outside agencies and city departments. And because the zone change to public facilities doesn't require a site plan, we didn't get a lot of comments back. We expect we'd get more comments, again, with those future applications for the plot and for a planned building group. There were no concerns expressed at this time. <clears throat> so we'll go over the criteria real quickly. Um, staff has concluded that this request does meet a majority of the zone change criteria. As the commission's aware, there are several that we use to evaluate a zone change request, and those have been detailed in the staff report. Um, I am going to go over a few quickly. The purpose of this zone change is to consolidate the zoning of the city-owned properties into one zone district. And staff feels that the public facilities zone district is appropriate for the proposed land uses in the public works parks maintenance master plan. Um, zone change is also consistent with the comprehensive plan. One of the six key values that that comp plan and vision we were just based on um, is to provide quality community amenities, services, and resources. Um, and the zone change and subsequent expansion of this maintenance facility would allow continued provision of those services. Um, we also feel that the consolidation of multiple departments, so public works, police, and parks operations all on the one site, would eliminate maybe some inefficiencies, and this supports the goals of the comprehensive plan and also provides a benefit to the community. 
staff also believes um, that although the maintenance facility is certainly one of the highest intensity uses in this area, um, the impact is there and has been there for a long time. That developed portion of the site um, required landscaping and screening in the zoning code will help to minimize additional impact by the development of this northern parcel. Um, staff further concludes that the proposed zone change will not adversely affect public health, safety, or welfare and that utility upgrades would have to be provided um, with future development as that may occur under the existing or proposed zoning. So for these reasons, staff does recommend approval of the zone change request, and this concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Lauren. Do we have questions for Lauren? Ann? Um, a couple questions, please. Uh, in the packet, on the top of page three, mm -hmm. it talks about the city storing their equipment in a floodplain, and it says it presents environmental and economic liability. Can you explain that sentence? Sure. Um, as it's been presented to me by the applicant who may be able to elaborate on this, okay. um, I should have I included the fact that currently parks maintenance and operations are based out of Anderson Park. So with the proximity to the Clear Creek, it's in the floodplain. Um, and my understanding is essentially keeping, you know, heavy and valuable equipment and fuels and everything else that they keep, fertilizer maybe, in the floodplain. In the, in, in the case of maybe a flood incident could be an issue. Um, okay. Okay. That equipment there. Um, second thing, uh, the zoning, the new zoning would allow for a 50-foot building. It would. That's kind of a concern in that neighborhood. It is. It, I can understand that. It would allow for a 50-foot building. What's been expressed to us at this point has not included plans for a 50-foot building. Okay. Um, but the neighborhood wasn't concerned. At there were, there, that was never <coughs> mentioned at the neighborhood meeting. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then third, um, even though the neighbors, th this is an existing use um, adjacent, um, were the neighbors concerned about any noise, any additional noise? There really wasn't a lot of concern about noise. Most of the maintenance happens inside the shop. Um, the grand plan for this site, I think, would to be have even a, a bigger vehicle maintenance shop. Um, most of the activity there is during the day unless there's a snow incident, so snow plows coming out early. Um, I think that's something that has been the case and would probably continue. I don't know that an expansion onto this site with the Parks Department would necessarily make it any worse. There wasn't expressed concern with it at the neighborhood meeting. Okay. And then the final question, landscaping, um, the 15-foot the um, foot buffer. buffer, thank you, with trees, I am assuming it's only on the north side? We would require it on all three sides of this property, so west, north, and east. Irrigated? Mm -hmm. Yep, new development, <laughs> so we would require the full 20% of the site be landscaped. Um, with the detention p facility proposed in that northeast corner, and then with 15-foot buffer, I think they'll get pretty close. Well, they have to. <laughs> and then finally, um, the ditch? Yeah. Um, I didn't, I must have missed it. Was there input from the ditch company? Or is this an abandoned ditch? I'm going to defer that question to the applicant. I know Public Works has worked on relocating that in the yep. last few years before my time. Okay, I'll defer. Thank you. Hey, Dick. Uh, yeah, I had to make up a question simply because I wanted to say pumpkin patch subdivision. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Uh, <laughs> More commonly referred to as lot two of the pumpkin it, patch. Subdivision. It looks to me like that is lot number two in the pumpkin patch subdivision. That's correct. Uh, when I look uh, at where uh, West 46th Avenue stubs into that property, it has a one-foot strip tract A. Could you explain that? Let's see. Good catch. I don't know if I can explain that. Spite strip. One foot strip. It's a spike strip. <coughs> Good job. Found another one. <laughs> Lauren, is it okay if I, I step yeah, in? It would be um, cool. Actually, when the. Pardon me? Okay. Actually, 
Uh, Mark Westberg is here with us tonight. He is uh, representing the Public Works Department as the applicant, and he said he would be happy to answer that question. Great. Yeah, uh, you can answer that for us uh, when you uh, when you come up. Um, anything else, Dick? Okay. Other questions from anyone? So far? Okay, I had a quick question. Uh, just in just in terms of the buffer landscaping, since um, minimizing impact is one of the sort of requirements that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, what's, uh, I'm, I'm assuming the, the landscaping is going to have to be inside that fence, that barbed wire fence. Yep. Um, is that going to be a particular benefit to this surrounding residences and so forth if the landscaping is just inside, inside the fence? Because what, what everyone on the outside is still going to see is a fence with a bunch of barbed wire on top. Sure. So in the... We haven't had many detailed discussions about site design. We haven't received the PBG application formally yet, but what we've expressed so far is that landscaping on that western side needs to be vertically oriented, so primarily trees, hopefully um, you know, trimmed six foot and taller trees um, as the best hope of trying to provide some sort of a screening effect with that barbed wire there. Okay, yeah, I, I, I know that's more of a, a site plan type of question but since since we're talking since one of the requirements that we're addressing is minimizing impact sure. I thought I'd bring it up here um, also I noticed there's a we can't see it on this on this shot but uh, in one of these I think the larger zoning map slide there's a conservation district over there in the Northeast mm -hmm. um, do you have any information on that and how that might be impacted by the zone change Sure. So my understanding is that a, it's a private property, and one of the zoning districts that we have in the zoning code is the conservation district. So it's not a conservation easement that's recorded through the county. Um, you know, conceivably the property owner could request a zone change to develop it. But um, my understanding, and I don't know this district as well as the others, is that you can't can't have any buildings on it. Is that a fair representation of? It is, and actually. Um the, the owner of the of that particular property has other properties in the area which she has devoted to uh, nature habitat and thus the con conservation uh, conservation district zoning on it not sure what her ultimate uh, intent is but um, okay. it's just the, the existing condition right now but you don't foresee any uh, negative impact on that conservation district from a rezoning of this property not at this point okay our understanding from the neighbors who discussed that property at the neighborhood meeting is that it is, it's been thriving despite the impacts that may exist from the <coughs> existing maintenance facility. They refer to it as the jungle, I believe. So That's where they have all the horses and, yeah. okay, yeah, really nice people over there. Okay. Any, any other last questions for Lauren? Amanda? I just had a question regarding the, the zoning and the whole idea of the Fruitdale sub area and how this fits in. I realize it's been here for, for many, many years, but sure. expanding that facility and sort of, I was just curious if planning had a discussion or around, because I'm, I'm wondering if down the road it will then want to expand again. And if we're saying that this is an area that is agriculturally thought about or devoted or, you know, I was reading the sub plan and just wanted to see what, your thoughts were on sure. that. Sure, um, we haven't we haven't really delved into that as far as you know future expansion because the limits of the public works and parks master plan was just this property. Um, it didn't consider any further expansion, so we hadn't considered any further expansion. Frankly, okay. All right. Okay, thanks, Lauren. Mm -hmm. If we can hear from the applicant, please. I was sick three weeks ago. I'm still coughing, so I'll apologize now. Uh, my name is Mark Westberg. Um, work out of this building, 7500 West 29th Avenue. Um, I can mostly just answer questions. I can go ahead and go over the list of questions you guys already have if you want to want to start out that way. I don't really have anything to add beyond what Lauren presented. Um, she did a great job of of presenting what we're planning on doing out there. So. Um, but I can just run down the list if that works for you guys. Um, on the floodplain question, um, our, our floodplains have changed a little bit or will be changing. We hear it's June this year. Um, 
that the new maps that we had done several years ago will be adopted by FEMA. Um, the Anderson Park facility, and it's, it's right off of Garrison, um, where the, the park's operations folks are now. It, it's currently a little bit in the floodplain, but in the future I think the whole thing becomes in the floodplain. And it's, again, one of those things where it's been there forever, and, and what was envisioned in the 2004 master plan was to combine all of our operations folks, parks and public works at one facility. The benefit of that, it gets them out of that facility. That area would then be incorporated into Anderson Park. I'm not sure exactly what the plans are for that, but, but it gets all that stuff out of the floodplain, which I get very excited about as a floodplain guy. So, um, so that, it, it, does that answer your floodplain question? Um, on the building height, the, the 2004 master plan was pretty specific about what was going to be done out there. Everything is going to be single story. Some of it's pretty big single story, but it's all single story, except for the administration building, um, which would be envisioned as a two story, just a standard two story office building. So that's what's been proposed today. I think if, and we're going to have that kind of information on our PBG. So if we ever want to go put something bigger out there, we're going to have to come back and see somebody for approval. And I think we probably have to go back to council for approval because it would be different from what's in the 2004 master plan. Um, on the noise, the only we've, we've had one person talk about when they're backing up the, the dump trucks to the uh, salt bar and the beeping noise. And want to know if we could turn that off. We can't. Um, so that's really the only thing. Well, we heard both at this neighborhood meeting, the neighborhood meeting we had two years ago for the when we purchased the property, was that that most of the neighbors think we're pretty good neighbors because it's pretty quiet during the day and it's actually pretty quiet at night except when there's a snow event. So um, we had some issues with some of the police folks driving a little quick on the roads, but I think we've dealt with that. We talked to the chief. Um, on the landscaping, we are planning on irrigating. We do have some water rights on the ditch that's there today, um, and I don't. I think they're planning on putting a pump in. Um, we're planning on putting native grasses in most areas so that we can sort of, you know, water them the first couple of years to get them going and then and then let them do what they do. Um, we're trying to keep that landscape buffer as, as low maintenance as possible. Um, but we do have some water rights on the dish that we have there. And then I think for the trees, we'd either hand water those for the first couple of years again. We're going to be picking native species and things. Um, or we'd, we'd run some drip lines or something out to those. But we're not going to... Um, be broadcasting a whole lot of water and, and try to get pristine sod between the buildings and the fence. Um, on the, the ditch itself, um, that's a lateral off of the ditch that runs along 44th, and for the life of me, I have lost the name of that in my head. I think it's the bayou. Um, to my knowledge, the only other user besides us on that ditch is the, the farmer that we bought the land from. Um, I understand he sometimes lets Miss Heine have some water for her stuff too, but um, he's the only other user. He's the only downstream user. And, so, and, and the ditch relocation was heavily coordinated with him to make sure that all it was okay. And we, we did talk to the Bayou folks too, but um, he's the only downstream user. It, it is a, a lateral that just runs down from, from the main ditch there. Uh, the spite strip. It is a spite strip. Um, for when, when I think when 46th Avenue was developed, they put the spite strip in and dedicated it to us so that this owner couldn't ever access off that road. But since we now own the property, the spite strip, we're not spiting ourselves. Um, but it is going to be an emergency access only. We do have a gate in the fence today, but we've got that just in case we have some kind of incident at our main gate or on, on Pearson or 45th, that we can still get our police in and out and we can get fire in and out. So, so it will be an emergency access only. I think there's going to be very few people that have the key to that one. Um, the perimeter landscaping, we've, we've talked a lot about perimeter landscaping. Um, we're working with Margaret Paget in our parks department. She's our plant lady over there. Uh, if you guys have met Margaret, she's wonderful, knows lots of stuff. What we're looking at doing is probably some fairly vertical stuff um, that, again, in, in my mind, we'd like to probably trim the first six feet up because that way it'll be easier for us to walk around back there and maintain it and then look for something to grow above that eventually um, so that we can we can reduce the impact of the buildings that are there. And, and if you've got a tree behind you and barbed wire in front, you're not really going to see the barbed wire, especially sort of with the, the brightness of the fence down below. So, so we think even though the barbed wire is in front of the, uh, the, the trees, I, I think they're still going to provide a lot, of, a lot of good buffering. And, and there's a couple of places where you can actually, most places on the entire perimeter is pretty much fence 15 feet and then building. So we're going to look at what we can do and, and reasonably do in that area to try to get trees to grow and and Margaret likes to have happy trees, so we're going to strive for that. 
Um, there are some areas that do, there's fence and then there's parking lot or just some open area. That's the location we're going to try to put some shrubs and stuff in so that we can make it look a little prettier for our folks that are out there working every day. Um, <clears throat> and versus expanding or moving. I know that that was addressed in the 2000 farm master plan. Um, they looked at what would it take to move this entire facility and have it be somewhere else outside the neighborhood in a more commercial or industrial area. And the cost of that was just absolutely prohibitive from the standpoint of moving the fueling station, which are not cheap, um, and some of those other things. And so they decided to combine on this lot. And the original plan was just to buy um, 170 feet, I believe, north. It didn't make any sense to leave 80 feet of that property in the the owner of the, the pumpkin patch lot one. Um, so so we bought the entire thing all the way up. So we actually have a little more room than than was originally envisioned. And we've managed to, as we're working on our PBG, fit everything that was that was needed at this facility that we need. And um, I, we don't really see the city growing a lot beyond what we are. It's kind of hard to do. And so we thank our, our parks and ops guys. They did a really comprehensive job when they when they looked at when they looked at this in the 2004 study, so we we think we're in really good shape that we can be here, and it's not going to need to get bigger than this. So that I think that answers everybody's question. So if anybody has anything else, other questions? Um, Tracy, I'd like to move to recommend approval of case number WZ. Is this oh. what you want me to do? Oh well, I I was just we're taking. Oh. Does anyone have any more questions? Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> No. Okay. Thanks. And uh, it looks like there's no one signed up to speak. Obviously, nobody here. So, um, so we'll close the public hearing. And Tracy, okay, you had something you were saying. <laughs> thanks. I move to recommend approval of case number WZ-12-01. Request a request for approval of a zone change from Ard Ard Agricultural. <laughs> <laughs> one to public faculties for a property located at 11210 West 45th Avenue, Pumpkin Patch Subdivision Lot 2 for the following reasons. Number one, the proposed zone change consistent with the goals and objectives of the City Comprehensive Plan and the Public Works Park, Parks Maintenance Master Plan. Number two, the proposed zone change will con consolidate the zoning on the city-owned property for the Wheat Ridge Maintenance Faculty. Number three, the proposed zone change will provide a benefit to the community by enabling con continued and effectively effective <laughs> proposed provision of the public service. Number four, the applicant will approve, provide adequate utility upgrades where needed when the property is developed. Number five, the proposed zone change will not be, will not have, will not adversely impact the public health or safety of welfare. Or welfare. <laughs> that was a long one. Second. Do we have any discussion? None. All right. Then I'll call for the vote on the motion, please. And the motion passes unanimously. All right. Um, before we move on to other items, I wanted to uh, welcome our new uh, commission members for District 3, Amanda Weaver. Welcome. And for District 4, Monica Duran. Hello. Um, and then does uh, staff have other items? I see here we have a 38th Avenue update. That is correct. And um, Mark has graciously agreed to stick around for a little bit. He has a um, actually been... Uh, very involved in it uh, from the public works uh, perspective. So if we can quit coughing, well, okay. I'll turn it over to Mark. All right, Mark. And, oh, before I forget, if you haven't received your newest issue of The Connections, it's got a really great write-up, um, not only about the plan, but also uh, the city won an award from the Colorado chapter of the Women in Transportation Stud Studies. So, and um, so we won a lo local award for best uh, small project for 38th Avenue Master Plan. Oh, great. Yeah, so. All right. Small project, it seems like a big project yeah. with as much time as we've invested in this thing. Um, the other thing that's on the, the, the connection on the cover there is a picture that, that Sarah Showalter has done a great job of putting together um, of what we 
we're calling a temporary amenity zone. We're now sole sourcing that, and so we can call it by its trademark name, a pop-up cafe, which or pop-up park, rather, which I think makes more sense to folks. Um, so basically, we've we've gone out to bid with the striping portion of this project. We're opening the bids next week. We hope they come in good. We've got 16 people that looked at the plan, so we're hopeful to get a lot of nice bids and, and get a good price on that. Um, and then we've we've gone out to bid also on the amenities portion of this project, which includes the little the little pop up park that you see there, um, and also um, some large planters, which will be four feet by six feet. Um, and made with similar material and have similar kind of plantings in them. We're going to have eight of those sort of scattered up and down the quarter. We've got three of those pop-up parks. And there's um, some really attractive concrete planters out there that are sort of a beige exposed aggregate that are left over from a long, long time ago. Um, we're going to reuse those and, and use nine of those scattered again up and down the quarter to try to add some more, um, some more plantings and stuff. Um, the leadership committee is actually getting a project going with some students and some others to see what they can do to make the planters prettier. Um, my boss thinks they look fine the way they are, but we're engineers, so what do we know? Um, so uh, that's gone out to bid, and that, that one opens, I believe, the first week of April or something along that time frame. And so we plan on getting started on the restriping right away as soon as we open bids and go to council and, and charge down that path. And then um, towards the end of that restriping project, then the amenities will will start to be put in. We're hopeful to have all of this stuff done by the, what are we saying now, mid-June, um, end of May, mid-June time frame. Um, there's, there's, the uh, businesses are getting the pop-up parks. We have three of them are really interested in getting those in as quickly as possible for people to go out and sit in. Um, they're going in at um, Dragonfly Cafe, I believe it's called. The Right Coast Pizza, which is the one that's being built at High Court and, and 38th. And then also at Ceviche's. Ceviche's is a little challenging because the sidewalk's raised there. So we've got to raise our, raise our pop-up park up a little bit. But um, all of those folks are very excited about getting these. We're going to have a two-year maintenance contract on all the plantings so that we can make sure that they look good at least for the first two years um, while they sort of get established in the, in the planters and everything. So um, that's pretty much what we're doing. Um, I'm assuming you guys sort of know that we're restriping to three lanes and so and getting parking on the south side and all those kind of things. The other thing we are getting, we are getting between Pierce and Upham, we are getting bike lanes. The existing pavement's extra wide there, so we're actually able to add some bike lanes there right in front of Wheat Ridge Cyclery. Pierce is one of our main routes on the bike, <coughs> excuse me, bike ped master plan that we hope to get bike lanes added to in the future. So that would be a great way to get people to that location and then they have a nice safe bike lane to bike on once they get on 38. So um, we're all really excited about this project and hope it goes really well and, and hope to have it all done pretty quickly here this spring and summer. And so if anybody has questions. And um, how come a pop-up park is in, I, I love the restaurant, ceviches, when they already have a front. A ginormous patio out a front? A ginormous patio yeah. versus... Um, just a little farther east, um, what's the Mexican restaurant? Oh, La Fonda? La Fonda. Yeah, we actually talked to La Fonda about it, and they weren't interested. Okay, and um, then way, way east, um, the um, Chinese-Japanese Oriental restaurant, way down by the billiard place, the Fusion. Like yeah. Oh. It, 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 from, from Chase Street East, oh. we're keeping the existing oh. lane configuration because there's just too much traffic in that area to neck it down to three lanes. So, and the problem at La Fonda is they're also not getting any parking out front. The driveways are so close there, we can't safely put anything in. Okay. Um, we had, we had talked with La Fonda about trying to consolidate some accesses and stuff, and, and we are doing that at, at, at some other locations where we're, we're shrinking the accesses down by, again, using these sort of, there, there'll be three-foot-tall aluminum planters with some stuff in them, and then, and then some cables in between to take what, what I'm affectionately calling attached parking lots um, to try to, and then restriping those so that we don't have people just pulling willy-nilly out into the street. So we've got a couple of folks that actually volunteered to have us do that to their parking lots. We're very excited about that. Um, so we're hoping those are going to go pretty well. Um, so Ceviche, when we talked with him about it, um, he said he opened in August, and the, the first weekend that he was open in August, his outdoor patio was full. Okay. The other thing we've talked about is these things are sort of modular. They're, they're like tinker toys or Legos, if you will. And so 
one of the things we've talked about doing with them is if this goes really well for them, they may want to add a whole other segment of it. They may want to add another 20 feet to it next year. They want to sort of see how it does this year. And if, if, if that gets full and their outdoor eating area gets full, they're going to want to try to expand that because they, they have the room to actually expand. The folks at Dragonfly and Right Coast, what, what we're going to be able to give them is pretty much all they can have at that location. Okay. I, I was just trying to understand the, the yeah. reasoning of it. Thank you. Yeah. He, he filled his patio last year is what he said. So he, he wants all the room he can possibly get. I, I, have, a, I have a question for you. Does, who pays for those? Does the city pay for those or does the business themselves pay for those? <clears throat> the city is actually buying all of the stuff that's in the plan. Um, we're we're going to have a agreement with the owners that, that have the both the access enhancements and the pop-up parks for them to maintain them to the point that they sort of keep them clean and pick up any trash and those kind of things. We, we think we have enough money in the budget that we can go ahead and maintain the landscaping so that we keep it all nice and uniform and keep it all looking really nice um, for this sort of two-year trial period that, that, that we're, we're planning on right now. So um, we are buying everything. And that's actually the model that's been used in both San Francisco and New York. And uh, Louisville, the, the business district that they have in Louisville actually sort of bought a bunch of these, it, not nearly as nice as ours, but they, they bought some of these things. They're sort of stick built. They're just more like a deck you'd have at your house. And they actually pick them up every winter and put them back down and stuff. But ours will stay there year round. Cause you know, we have these weird days, middle of February that are 70 degrees and, and we think they'll be used a lot. So Dick. Uh, yeah. Will uh, smoking be allowed in these uh, pop-up uh, cafes? You know, I, to the extent that the, it's allowed in any other outdoor eating area, because this will be an outdoor eating area, most of these folks are going to get their liquor license revised to allow them to serve alcohol on the pop-up park, too. Um, even without it being contained? Even without it being contained. We've checked with the city attorney's office and with the, the liquor licensing folks, and as long as it's included in their license, now you can't, you can't take a drink out there, you can be served out there, and then, of course, you can't leave with your drink from there either. So it'll be very similar to what other outdoor eating areas are. Now, the guys at Wright Coast are talking about, because they've got some extra sidewalk and stuff there, about applying for a permit to actually add some railing and stuff so they can sort of enclose that area and have it a little more defined um, so that they can, they can have about eight feet of what's paved out there also be part of their outdoor eating area. So similar to what's been done up in Arvada with the Old Town, mm -hmm. you know, so they're sort of looking at that option also. I think they want to get open first and see how they do. But they're looking at, at not just using our area, but some of the sidewalk area they too, and then getting some railing and put around it and contain it a little bit. But, um, yeah, it's, it's actually, we, I was surprised, but it's allowed. So I, I don't know what the rules are about smoking. And certainly these folks could say they could put up a little sign that says no smoking if, if that becomes an issue. So, Amanda? It, it will be public space, and, and that the part, it gets very fuzzy very quickly. Okay. Um, and that's why we've got the agreement that sort of talks about they're going to be the ones sort of policing it, maintaining it, and those kind of things. If someone starts disturbing the peace out there, they'd be the ones that could either, you know, ask the person to leave or um, could call the police and that kind of thing. So, um, again, it, oh, it's real similar to what Old Town Arvada has got with their, the little areas that they've got along those restaurants. I think those are still public right away up there, but they've got some agreements that that spell all this stuff out. So our, our city attorney has gone over that with a fine tooth comb. And okay. Hopefully we got it all. Yeah, so anybody wandering by can go walk in there and just sit down if they want to. They don't have to order something. They don't have to order something necessarily. Okay. Other questions? <coughs> other questions? Other questions? Uh, pretty cool. I'm excited that uh, that it's moving along. And uh, so you, you guys are thinking it will all be installed in June? I, I think we're wow. shooting for mid-June. Starting in May, we've, given, yeah. we've only given the contractor six weeks, which is probably going to affect our pricing a little bit. Yeah. But we think it's going to go. We went to city council a week or two ago. Uh, yes. To get, thanks. I don't do dates or names. So um, we went to city council on March 5th to get permission to sole source the product, which is what you see in the rendering that Sarah put together. Um, if you're interested, you can, you can type, you can Google. I don't know if you can do it up there now, but I would. Um, you can Google bison green roof. And it'll pull up Bison um, NP in, or IP Innovative Products. Um, and that's who we're getting the stuff from. So you can go pull up. They've got pictures of this stuff. They've got all kinds of really cool stuff on their website. So um, if you want to go look at what we're getting, we think it's a really neat thing. It runs probably 30 to 40% higher than doing it stick built. But we think it's going to look so good and council agreed that it's worth the money to do. The other nice thing is if is if we actually widen the street someday and do some things, we can actually pick these things up and take them apart and go 
plunk them down somewhere else. Great. Well, I'm, I'm just. I think it's 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 good for the for the whole corridor to to address this as as quickly as as everyone is. Um, and I I appreciate. Uh, I think a lot of people appreciate the the speed at which this is going to happen. Just to just to get it done, because I know along 38th for a long time, I've I've had people tell me, well, you know, it's another plan, and you're going to make a plan, and then you're not going to do anything. And it's nice to see stuff getting done. And We're I'm, implementing I'm, and the plan. Yeah, implementing the plan is. Yeah, good. you drive down Wadsworth right now, and it looks like a whole new city is going on there. You go this over here and that over there, and then 38th. That's looking going to look nice. Yeah, it's exciting. Right, Ann. Did you? I, I just have a question. Um, any murmurings about 38th and Wadsworth, the uh, dealership? Um, no, I mean we've had several inquiries, and um, it's tough because the there's so many there's ownership five pieces. owners. Yeah. So Plus, so nothing serious at this point. Okay, I just didn't know if there there was any discussion of the owners getting together and bonding. Yeah. Okay. Just, just wondering. I, I heard a business owner talking, um, hoping that that was going to be developed. He was looking at moving temporarily, hmm. signing a short-term lease, okay. thinking that something was going to move in there. So that's why I was wondering if there had been any murmurings. Thank you. We still, um, you know, have high hopes. That's one of our most developable pieces in the city, and sort of at a landmark location. So, um, you know, it's interesting. We are seeing a lot of new projects along the Wadsworth Corridor. And then, of course, on 38th, we've got this mm -hmm. synergy that started. So everybody do this. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks for the update, guys. I move for approval or uh, for <laughs> <laughs> approval of adjournment. I'll second. <laughs> okay, vote, please. All right. We stand adjourned. Thank you.